All praise belongs to Allah. We praise him, we seek his forgiveness and his guidance. We seek refuge in Allah from the evils of our own egos and the evil results of our deeds. Anyone whom Allah guides, then no one can lead him astray. And anyone whom Allah leaves to stray, then there is none that can guide him. And I bear witness that there is nothing worthy of worship and no gods in reality except Allah, the one and only, having no partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad ibn Abdillahi sallallahu alayhi wasallam is his slave and his messenger. Allah says what could mean, O you who believe, fear Allah, respect Allah, have taqwa for Allah as it is his right to have taqwa and don't you dare die except that you die as Muslims. O mankind, fear your Lord who created you all from one soul, Adam, and created from that soul its mate, Eve, and raised up and spread from the two of them many men and women. And fear Allah, the one whom you ask things for, and don't cut ties with the wombs that bore you. Indeed, Allah above us all is laying in watch. O you who believe, fear Allah. And in light of your fear of Allah, your respect for Allah, then say a word that goes straight to the point. Allah has promised us if we do that, yuslih lakum a'malakum. He will correct something that you did wrong, rectify your deeds, and forgive you your sins. And whoever is already obeying Allah and already obeying his messenger has already achieved the highest aspiration anyone can achieve. Excuse me. Red Bull. As for what follows, then we must know that the best speech is the speech of Allah the best guidance is the guidance of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the most evil of affairs are those things that we ourselves as humans bring into the picture. Each one of these things is something that leads us astray. And anything that leads us astray will eventually lead us to the hellfire. We're talking about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam during his trials and tribulations. Now this topic to me was, I guess it, it was a conundrum at first. Because when you're a prophet, what aspect of your life is not a trial and a tribulation? Are we gonna deal with it from the perspective of him being a prophet? I think not because that wouldn't be fair for us. As being him a prophet, وسلم, he's safe. And he has to react in his professional capability as a prophet. And he didn't fail in doing that. So I chose to deal with it. The trials and tribulations that I'm going to mention are not trials and tribulations tied to him being the prophet, but tied to him being a man, a regular man. So what are those times in his life, alayhi salatu wasalam, that there were trials and tribulations for him? Well, the first one we can see was when the wahi first came to him. When he first met Jibreel and he had that experience, how did he react? Because what we're supposed to see here, what we want to learn in glimpses of the life with the Prophet وسلم, how he reacted under this adversity. What did he do? Anybody tell me? It's not a khutbah lecture. Come on Muslims, what did he do? Yes. He was scared, but what did he do? He went home to his wife. He didn't go to the bar. He didn't go see the fellas. He went home to his wife, Barakallah Fikum, 
and he explained the whole situation to his wife. He told her what happened and he sought solace with his wife. So we're building up here. The next great fitna or trial that I chose to deal with is when he told his family, when he called the Quraysh together and he told them, I am the prophet. He came out, out loud and said this. He called them together and we know we have the surah Tabbat yada abi lahabin wa tab. And he called them together and he said, look, I'm a prophet. Listen to what I have to say. Now we know, if we think and imagine for ourselves, what would your family do if you, to call your family together, have a nice big gathering together, not that you tell them that you're a prophet, but you tell them, look, now I'm going to guide you guys. And we're all Muslim or we're not all Muslim, whatever, but I'm going to give you guidance to the right way. That's a plausible statement. How would they treat you? What would they say to you? And imagine these things were said to the prophet because remember the situations with the prophet is are extreme or extended more than for the regular human being. As the prophet sallallahu he taught us that the fitness for human beings, that's one thing, that's one level. But when it happens to the righteous and the, the, the salihin and the prophets, then it's extended because the level of test is based on their level of iman. So however your family would react to you, we know how they reacted to the prophet. They rejected him. They called him names, said he was crazy. Now what would you do if your family said, you know, okay, we know you're Muslim, but don't, come on, don't, don't get out of line. You're acting crazy. You're an extreme. And they start calling you names. You probably wouldn't be too patient with that. Especially, your, I think, your brother, your, your cousins. You respond, but how did the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, respond? Anybody tell me? This side, the last time, this, that's over here. How did the Prophet respond when his family, the Quraysh, rejected his message? The brother with the beautiful Kufi. No? Well, no, that's how Allah responded. Okay, <laughs> that's the response of, of Allah when he sent down Tabbat Yadah. He invoked the curse on Abu Lahab himself. But how did the Prophet ﷺ respond? Yes. Now, he carried on. He didn't respond in a negative way. He kept being kind to them. Jazakallah khair, jazakumullah khair. He kept on being kind to them. He kept on promoting his message. He didn't respond to them in negativity. And there's some benefit in doing that. Because it allowed them to come. Once they got their ugliness out, then that's all they have, right? There's nothing. You can't say it 15 times and it have the same effect. Now you start looking silly. Right? And the guy's still being polite and kind and still going on. And so now the actions start speaking louder than the words. The next fitna or trial that I want to call our attention to in the life of the Prophet Muhammad as a human is when his uncle Abi Talib passed away. Now this was a great fitna, wasn't it? This was a fitna because this was his protector. He wasn't Muslim. He was his protector, which was a kind of a benefit, if you think about it. Had he been a Muslim, it would have been harder for him to protect the Prophet ﷺ. But by the very fact that he was a respected pagan chief, it was difficult for the Quraysh to do anything to the Prophet Muhammad. But now with his passing, with his passing and they're out there, Remember, when he passed away, they were already in, in, in hubs, in a restricted area. And people already have an embargo not to marry, not to sell, not to really deal with them. They're making hijrah from them. How did the Prophet ﷺ respond to this? Does anybody know? So we did the right, we did the left. Hakatha. Well, actually, Daniel answered the first one. Over here, so you guys are off the hook. We'll go to the back. How did he respond? Yeah, brother with the white thobe looking right at me. Salaam alaikum. Yeah, you. <laughs> Sorry? 
He was waiting for his Saddam Miraj. No, it's not the answer. No. Now, now you got the next one. Go in the back. Yes, no, don't turn around. Now. Fuddle. Is you gonna come forward and answer the question? I'll answer it, inshallah. First thing he did, the Prophet Sallallahu he said, I will continue to make dua for my uncle. I'll continue to make dua for him as long as Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala doesn't prevent me. So he did something here that we can view as a human mistake from on the side of Islam because then Allah corrected him and told him not for the believers to make dua for the dead mushrikeen and kufar. But we see the point here. He made dua for him because it wasn't like he hated this man. He hated his shirk. He hated his kufr and his rejection of the truth. But he did not hate that rajul, the, that physical person himself that was still his uncle. He didn't make like the man never did any good to the Prophet ﷺ. He recognized the good that the man had for him in his lifetime. And this is very important for us to recognize as Muslims because a lot of times when we have these families who are not as Muslim as we are or as much as we think we are, because you know we have these different attitudes. We have the way we are in our homes with our family, the way we are in the street, and the way we are inside ourselves. Okay, and the one inside we don't really like to show to anybody. So this way we see ourselves and the way we view others, he didn't look down on his family until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to him, you cannot make dua for this person. There's no dua for the mushrik in this regard. And then after that, what did he do? He remained silent. You don't hear him speaking about him, talking bad or negative or saying, oh yeah, that mushrik. He didn't go out of his way to debase the memory of his uncle. Do you understand the point and how he dealt with it and what we can take from that in dealing with those people who we deem less Islamic than we are, yet there are family members, the same people who probably changed our diapers, taught us how to walk, how to ride a bike, and did the various things that they did, and the main people that are going to put their money up to help bury us if we precede them to the grave, these people. So he kept good ties and good relations with them, even though they were still mushrikeen. But he didn't compromise. On his, and his non-compromising didn't make him rude. You understand? And during trials or tribulations, this death of his uncle, it didn't make him say something foul or lose hope. The next great trial that the Prophet ﷺ went through as a man, the same year, was the death of Khadija. Now Khadija was his first wife. His first wife. And he lived, he didn't have another wife. And he loved her. And also she was wealthy. So she spent her money on him. May Allah give us wealthy wives. I mean. Had to throw that in there. You said I mean. I mean, alhamdulillah. I mean. I had to say it again. <laughs> At any rate, when Khadija passed away, this was a great trial and tribulation for the Prophet ﷺ because he loved his wife. She was a source of support for him from the very first day in Islam. If we, and a lot of people break it down, the first woman to accept Islam, the first man, the first boy. She was the first person to accept Islam. She believed in him. So now with her passing, what did he do? Anybody know? The man cried for two days. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He cried for two whole days. He was a man. He was a human. We don't have it anywhere else where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam cried for two whole days so we can see this was one of the biggest trials and tribulations that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam went through when he got kicked out of Ta'if and stoned he didn't cry he bled he was wounded didn't bust a tear 
didn't bother him. It, it did bother him. I shouldn't say it didn't bother him. Because he said, as long as the law is okay, I'm good. Because, you know, that's part of his job. That's not personal, right? But this was intimately personal. And it should teach us that it's all right for us to love our wives and have that tenderness and compassion that he cried for two whole days. Then after that, he had to get on with it. He didn't even have enough to bury his wife. You know, there was no shroud because this happened when they were mahbusun. They were out in the restricted area. So they didn't have any money. They didn't have any cloth. He couldn't even find a shroud to wrap Khadija up, radiyallahu anha. So he had to wrap her up in what the Arabs used as a khimar, a head covering that they used to cover their face. And that was all he had to use to bury his wealthy wife that helped him and spent all her money, all her wealth on him. Now he couldn't even have enough money or enough resources to find something to shroud her properly. That's something that caused him great grief. If you understand what I'm saying. Cause them great grief. Because you want to show your appreciation and your reciprocacity by, you know, doing her the best that you can. So we see that. Then we have the death of Hamza. Radiallahu an Hamza. When Hamza was martyred, I shouldn't say the death of Hamza. Because Allah tells us not to say that the martyred are dead. And we need to follow that. When Hamza was martyred in the battle, this was another source of great anguish and pain for the Prophet wasallam. But he didn't breathe a word about it. He stomached it. You understand? See the differences when what's going on? This was war. Hamza was a man, radiallahu anhu. He knew it. They made an oath, a pledge to Allah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. And they stood by it. And he was martyred behind standing up for la ilaha illallah, Muhammad rasulullah. So the Prophet accepted that. But he didn't forget. Who killed? Who martyred Hamza? What? You calling me names? Wahshi. Wahshi means wild. Okay? That's what Wahshi means. So Wahshi was a person who was bad with that spear. And he got his freedom. You can't blame the man. He was a slave. Hind came to him and said, look, I got to give you an offer you can't refuse. Because if you refuse, they're going to might make life miserable for him. Right? He's still a slave. But if you do this job, you get your freedom. Who wouldn't do that? And you don't know. You don't believe in the prophet. The person doesn't believe that he's the messenger of Allah. He's not even involved in those types of things. So he didn't know. He didn't believe. And he went out there and he killed. He, 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 he shuts his arrow and he hits, hits Hamza mid-body and Hamza's martyred. Radiallahu anhu. He gets his spear. He goes back. He proves that he, he did that to Hamza. That he martyred Hamza. He gets his freedom. Years go by said the prophet never never spoke about it didn't didn't complain no he didn't complain sallallahu alaihi wasallam when wahshi comes he comes to accept islam i'm saying the brothers the believers are in medina now so they're in medina he comes and he explains that i want to accept islam i am wahshi so the prophet says wahshi okay Tell me how you killed Hamza. What happened at Badr? Well, I mean, at Uhud. What did you do? So Wahshi misunderstands. Instead of just explaining what the circumstances were under, he glorifies the story of the martyrdom of Hamza. And you could see it disturbing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You could see that the story of, the, of his uncle, his close uncle being martyred was doing to his ears, listening to this. But he didn't say anything. And then when Wahshi finished telling the story, he said, we accept your slam, but I don't never want to see you again. I don't want to look at your face again. So what did Wahshi do? Instead of running away with his Islam, going someplace else, leaving Medina, Wahshi became the shadow of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
When the Prophet ﷺ would say, Assalamu alaikum, while she would say, Assalamu alaikum, get up, and then the Prophet move, while she would be a little bit behind him. Prophet turn around, while she would move that way. Move this way. He'd be always a little bit behind the Prophet. Became like a bodyguard, right? But anywhere he turned, while she was behind him. He never stood in front of the Prophet wasallam again. Imagine that type of dedication. That type of understanding. Okay? And the Prophet didn't say, nah, I don't mean that. You don't got to do that. Nah. He was a man. I don't want to see you no more. It still hurt. I accept, as my job as the Prophet, I accept your Islam. Me as a person, I don't want to see you. I got that right. And we noticed that from the Prophet. And he didn't change his word. After he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, died, just to finish the story of Wahshi, he took that same spear because the Prophet came to the Masjid and said, I had a dream of two gold bangles on me. And then they, they hit them and they fell apart. And I think these are the two liars, you know. And so the Prophet, I mean, Wahshi understood the Prophet's having a problem, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, with this Musaylimah al kadhab this liar, this imposter Prophet. So he goes out there and with the same, same spear that he martyred Hamzid with, he kills Musaylimah al kadhab So he follows up the bad deed with a good one. Hoping that it'll wipe it away. But the point for our discussion today is that the Prophet وسلم, he had a mawqif, he had a stance as a human being based on this type of situation. And we don't say that he held a grudge, but there was pain there. There was some hurt due to this situation. The next situation we have is where the Prophet وسلم, his wife Aisha radiallahu anha was slandered. Now this is a big personal fitna. Notice the things that I'm pointing us to. These are things dealing with him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as a person, not as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So here his wife, his young wife, she gets lost from the caravan, meaning, you know, she went, everybody knows the story, right? She goes out to look for the bangle, the, the kalad, the necklace that she had, that she borrowed, she comes back, the whole place is gone. Everybody's gone. But Alhamdulillah, the Prophet in his wisdom, he sent a man back to go check to make sure everything was okay. And he found her, recognized her, loaded her on the camel, and walked back to Medina with that. But this didn't stop the people from slandering her and saying that she snuck off to have an affair with this man. You know, she's too young, she's too hot, and all this nasty talk, they're talking about Aisha radiallahu anha. They're saying this type of thing, saying she committed adultery. The wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what did the Prophet do? Did he run over there and bust that guy in the mouth? Say, what she was doing with my wife? No, I mean, sir, some of us would do that. Some of us would take the speech and not even think about it. Some of them would go and divorce the wife, beat her up publicly. We see what the Muslims do, or do it privately, like some of the brothers here do. So what did the Prophet Wasallam do? It's very unique, this situation. He didn't talk to any of the senior men. In this situation, we note the Prophet did something totally, you know, what looks strange. He didn't talk to any of the senior elder Sahaba. He only talked to the young guys, the younger Sahaba. Like Ali ibn Abi Talib and, 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 and younger, asking them their opinion, what they thought. And he talked about the, he didn't, he didn't just say she did it. He came to the masjid and he said, yo, who's going to, you know, straighten out this situation? This guy, they're accusing of, he never came to my house except that I was there. I got no reason to suspect this guy about my wife. And he know, he's no reason for me to suspect his wife, my wife. So the Prophet, وسلم, he didn't blame his wife. He didn't blame the other guy. He was patient. And patience has been described as complaining to Allah, not to the humanity. Not making statements that we're going to regret later. Being patient means persevering. Not just like somebody tied up on a chair, wiggling because they can't get up. And not just waiting, doing nothing. Making dua and moving proactively. He asked the slave girl, what do you think about Aisha? Oh, Aisha, I don't find nothing wrong with her. But she complained from a slave girl's perspective. But she leaves the, the, the dough out and the animals come and eat the bread. 
You know, that's a concern of a slave girl because she's got to clean up that mess. She's got to go to the store and get more bread. And this lady's leaving it out. And that's the only thing she can complain about. He's talking about Zina and he's talking about the bread being left out. So he really not nothing that she could complain about dealing with the issue. And then he goes to Aisha's arch, not enemy, but arch rival, Zainab bin Josh. These two were arch rivals, and if you look at the hadith all the time, they're competing with each other for the attention of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Aisha is saying, "Look, I'm the only virgin here. I don't know why he's married to us, you guys." That's what Aisha is saying, you know. And then Zainab is saying, "You know what? Who married you to the Prophet? Oh, your father. Well, Allah married him to me." They're going back and forth like that, you know. And Aisha says, "Well, you know, why that that why he came down in my house." <laughs> they're going back and forth because all the revelation only came down in Aisha's house. So this is the person who, if they had an opportunity, you would think they would say something negative. She didn't say anything negative. I don't know nothing bad about Aisha. You see? I don't know nothing bad about her. But they're in competition all the time. The reality came down when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed what he revealed about that as an example of how we should deal with slander and how we're supposed to turn it over to those people who are responsible to deal with it. But the point for our talk here is that we can't now in our life claim that we have situations that are not covered in the Sharia, like trials and tribulations that we don't see from the life of the Prophet Sallallahu He dealt with the same type of issues that we deal with, family issues. Let's put aside the things about the Prophet, but these are things dealing with him personally and his family. And we see that the mawqif, the, the stance that he took in all these situations has one word, a sabr. A sabr. He was perseverant and patient. So we need to, if we're going to follow the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and try to utilize the, some examples that he has in his life in our own life then we need to extract this word sabr which is mentioned in the Quran over 90 times which brings another question how many times does Allah have to say something for us to pick it up? how many times do you tell your child after you told them once or twice I told you twice already you didn't hear me? and we get upset right? I told you three times not to do such and such a so and you see, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is dropping this word sabr, literal, sabr, over 90 times in the Quran. Is that enough example for us to know that this is something that we should implement and have in our life? Yes or no, guys? I want some, I want some um, admittance here. We need to have sabr. And if you just sit silent, if you just sit quietly, then I'm not sure that you, 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 you commit to this. So what we need to do, really openly have a commitment, make an open commitment in ourselves to have sabr. And so I challenge every last one of you to look up the word sabr within the next 24 hours. Look it up. Read every definition and chance of it, every style of it, and try to understand it better than you do at this moment. And make a conscious conviction in your own heart here to change and to add more sabr. I'm not saying you don't have any, but try to put more sabr into your life from now on. Because we notice that the companions were like this. Because after we talk about the prophet, we have to see how the companions responded. How were they? What did they take? And we notice that these men were patient men. They had a lot of sabr. Everybody knows the story of Omar. His wife is pounding him in the chest. She's screaming so loud and yelling, calling him all types of names. And everybody can hear it outside the house. And the man's knocking the door and says, oh, I messed up. And he said, well, you're being quiet. We're not like that. Our wife raised, don't you raise your voice in my house. Don't we don't take that for half a second. I'm trying to be patient with you, woman. That's the way we are. You know? but, but that's not right. If we want to take the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
with patience, with his family and with his family, his family affairs, we need to realize that there is no patience without yaqeen, a sabr wa yaqeen. These things go hand in hand. And this is the, the direction that I'm giving you. Because after the, we cover those things, what am I telling you? First, I'm telling you, you need to have sabr. Next, I'm telling you, the reality of sabr will never be attached to you until you have yaqeen. What is yaqeen? What is, what is yaqeen? Thank you. What? What? Again? You hear that? He said certainty, conviction. It's like, I, I was teasing you. I heard you. I just wanted you to keep yelling. You know? It's certainty. Certain of what? When I say sabr wal yaqeen, what am I referring to? The brother with the beautiful beard and the black thing right there. What are we talking about when we say certain of what? Yes. What are we certain? Everybody's turning around looking at you, bro. What are we certain? What are we certain of? Anybody know? We're not certain then. Yeah, it again. We're certain of death. And what are we certain about death? What? I can't hear you. That we're going to meet Allah. Well, we're going to know we're going to meet Munkar and Nakir, right? First. And then we're going to be resurrected. And then we're going to have the scales are going to be established. So we're clear about the last day. We're clear about belief in Allah and the last day. This is a reality, right? So we're clear also that Allah's way is the only way, basically. So there cannot be any patience unless you're certain that your patience is going to come to a result that you want, right? And this is the reason why people disobey Allah and do things their own way. Because they're not certain that they'll get the result that they want. Not the right result, but the result that they want if they do it the way Allah says to do it. That's why the guy begs zina. He doesn't want to go and ask the father because he might say no. Or he might reject him for some reason. So I'll just go around him so I can get one. No patience because he has no yaqeen. He has no son. The robber, he goes to steal because he's not certain that his skills are going to get him the amount of money that he wants so he can live the life. So he goes and steals out of his jealousy and his uncertainty. All the crimes that people commit is because it's a lack of certainty that if they're patient along the correct path, that they'll get what they want. So we need to first be certain and have yaqeen that we're going to meet Allah and that we're going to have to be judged for everything that we did here and then on top of that if we want to go to Jannah that we are certain that following the Sunnah or the Sunnah is better that's what we have to be saying then we can be patient upon the Sunnah does that make sense? does it? so then that's what I want you guys to think about patience and Yaqeen and we have the example of the Prophet Wasallam. In all those situations, we don't see him acting outside of patience. What we see Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam doing is acting with full patience in his personal affairs, not just his affairs as being the Prophet. I'm sorry, there was a point that I was supposed to mention here. The reason why we're, we're certain and we're patient is because we realize that the one who's testing us is who? Right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, if you never get a, any time you get a, any type of trial and tribulation, remember this ayah. Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, I'm, I'm only a few minutes off, okay? The, he says here that I am the one, without doubt, I'm testing you. So you got a problem with the test? Allah says, I am the one that's testing you with fear, hunger, the loss of this, the loss of that, even the loss of your own souls. 
but give glad tidings to who? A sabirin. Who are those who are being patient? Those that when something happens to them, some musibah, some trial or tribulation afflicts them because it's not something bad. Stop translating it something bad. It's something you don't like. It might be some good in it. Okay? So it says when something that you dislike happens to you, they say what? They say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Why this statement? Because it reconfirms. It gives you more yaqeen. By saying it out loud, it makes you feel that that's what I believe. And if you didn't have any belief in it, it strengthens your belief in it. That's why we say something happens, we say, La ilaha illallah. It says, Inna lillah. We belong to Allah. So it reminds us, we are the property of Allah. We are the creation of Allah. He can do with us whatever He wants to. And we can get this, this feelings of, of over-entitlement off of us. Because that's what the mentality, the ego tells us, I'm entitled to have a good life. Who said? Nobody said. So he is tested. So we say, Inna lillah. So we first get that feeling that we are entitled. We're inna ilayhi raji'un. And we're returning to him. So we better watch out. We're going back. So we better watch out because we're going to be judged about this. These are those that have the salah to min rabbihim. What? Allah is making salah on us? So it's not that Allah is offering salah, but mentioning us in the mala al-a'la, mentioning us in a beautiful way in the, the, the high circles of the angels with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa ulaik alayhim, they have the rahmah, the mercy of Allah is on them too. Okay? Those that translate the word salawati min rabbihim as the mercy of Allah have made a mistake because it's not the mercy of Allah and then the mercy of Allah. It's the mention of Allah and then the mercy of Allah. And these are the ones who have accepted the guidance, muhtadun. Those who have accepted the guidance of Allah. So remember this when you have some trial or tribulation. This time. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <laughs>